But you know what? It's so, it's so good to gather together this morning. Uh, I'm going to be speaking a message today on a heart set above. Now, over the last few weeks, we've been looking at and following a series called First Things First, and that's just been such a, uh, a great, fun series to think really practically, how are we putting things in place in our life to grow closer towards who Jesus is? But this morning, we're going to be looking at this idea, what does it mean to have a heart that is set above? You know, many years ago, I had my first experience on a motorbike. Anyone uh, ridden a motorcycle before? Yeah, a couple, of, uh, a couple of laughs and fun things going on there. Well, I had my first experience on a motorbike, and, uh, and actually, to be fair, it was a Pee Wee 50, which is, you know, it's a children's motocross. It's about, it's about this big. However, I did do it as an adult. So I got on this Pee Wee 50, and there's just something so fun about it. Now, with any kind of activity like this, right, when you first start doing it, you're not very confident in your skills. And when you're not very confident, you tend to take it pretty easy. You go a little bit slower. You're kind of really mindful of the fact that if I fall off, I'm really going to hurt myself. Then you hit this really dangerous phase where the confidence levels rise, but the skills are still really low. Now, I hit that point on my first afternoon on this motorbike. I'm going to call it a motorbike from now on. Now we've established that it was, in fact, a Pee Wee 50. Now, I got on this thing, and I started getting confident. So I started hitting the corners a little bit tighter. We were going around a circuit. And I went around this, uh, this, this bend really, just really fast. I must have been going, what, 20, 25 k's an hour. Just took it real fast. Uh, that, that's not that fast, but it feels fast when you're on a motorbike for the first time. And, and I happened to go through a wet patch of turf. And I lost control, and I got some speed wobbles. Anyone had that speed wobble feeling before? Whether it's a skateboard, a push bike, uh, a Pee Wee 50, whatever it might be. Uh, I hit the speed wobbles hard, and I noticed in front of me there was this really big tree, a really big tree. And I came through this corner, I hit the wet turf, started wobbling, and I was just looking at this tree thinking, mustn't hit the tree, mustn't hit the tree, mustn't hit the tree. And of course, I rode directly into the tree. And I think along the way, I panicked and accelerated instead of braked, because again, the confidence up here, the skills uh, way down here. And I hit this thing hard. Now, it happened to be a tree. You know those trees, it's like a big, thick trunk, and then it branches off in like a Y shape, so there's two big branches going each side. I flew right through the middle. (laughs) It's like, and this is is all completely true. Flew right through the middle of the thing. It's like really, really fortunate that it was a a Y shaped tree, tree and not a regular shaped tree. Flew through the middle of this thing. And uh, I told this story to a friend of mine, Riley, who's part of our team here at True North. He's actually speaking at our Merrill campus. And he's into like real motocross, not Pee Wee 50 motocross. And he said, Phil, the golden rule of motocross is where you look is where you go, right? If you're looking at something, that's where you're going to go. So when I panicked, I'm looking at this tree and I'm like, (laughs) just went straight into it. What I needed to do was look at the open field of grass and allow the bike to take me gently away from the giant tree. Now, as I reflected on that phrase, and of course it resonates straight away with the human heart and mind, that there's so much truth in this idea that what we're focused on will bring shape to our life, and what we focus on will determine the direction of our life. And that's been the big idea through our First Things First series, that whatever comes first, that whatever we make the highest priority will bring the greatest forming impact on our lives. And it's been wonderful to lean into that over the last few weeks. But I want to take you this morning to a passage of Scripture in Colossians chapter 3, where Paul the Apostle is writing a letter to a young group of Christians who have recently come to faith in Jesus. He's in house arrest in Rome. And he's writing a letter to encourage a young church that just a few years earlier had come to to find salvation in Christ through the work of a young evangelist named Epaphras. And he'd gone, he'd told them about Jesus, Uh, a whole group of them had placed their faith in Jesus, and then he left And you've got this church then that's trying to discover what does it mean to live out the Christian faith. And along the way, they get a little bit led to the left and to the right, and their hearts, their minds get set on some other things, and their faith is shaped and influenced in a way that takes them away from the purity of Jesus as their salvation. And so Paul writes them a letter to realign them with who the Savior is. And I want to take you to this passage of Scripture, and we're going to open our Bibles in Colossians chapter 3. If you've got a Bible, you can open that up. And in fact, real quick, I know I've I've prayed already, but I want to pray once more this morning, because I want to pray that God would speak to us through the power of Scripture this morning. Can I pray for us real quick? God, I want to thank you for your Word. 
God, I want to thank you that, that your word has power within it, Lord. And God, as we lean into this passage in the scripture together this morning, I pray that you would speak to each one of us, Lord. We give you this time, we give you this space, and we say, God, come and speak. Amen. All right, let's look at this verse together. And here's what Paul says. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. He's identifying that they placed their faith in who Jesus is. Listen to this phrase. Set your hearts on things above. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. And then he uses another phrase and another key word. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. That's his poetic way of saying that you have come to salvation, the old self is gone, and now you're a new creation hidden away in the mysteries of who God is. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And then he speaks to the future second coming of Christ and the glory that we'll experience as followers of Jesus. But what I love and what I want to draw our attention to is this idea of hearts and minds set above. And the distinction and the contrast that, that Paul seems to be creating for us is this difference between what it means to have a life with hearts and minds set above versus a life lived with hearts and minds set below. And the contrast is that above is the things of Christ. When hearts and minds are set above, we're, fa- we're fixing ourselves on who Jesus is. And then anything below that is kind of the earthly things. They're the things really of self. So he says, set your hearts on things above. You know, whenever I think of the heart and when Scripture uses the word heart, and in particular, to set your heart on something. Ever heard that phrase, my, my heart was just set on it? Anyone said that before, whether it's about a new whatever or something or experience? Oh, that my heart was just set on that thing. My heart was set on it. Now, the heart's an interesting thing. The heart really is the shaper of our desires. Have you ever heard another phrase? The heart wants what? The heart wants what the heart wants, right? Now, normally when we talk about that phrase, at least in my experience, it's when you're in a bad relationship and you don't want to admit it. So you say, well, I know this isn't great for me, but the heart wants what the heart wants, right? Has anyone ever done that before? Don't put your hands up. (laughs) The heart wants what the heart wants. But then I want to take you quickly to another passage of Scripture. I'm going to make sure I get it right. I think it's Jeremiah 17. Yeah, it is. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. You won't know it by the reference, but you'll know it when I say it. But the heart is deceitful above all things. The heart wants what the heart wants, but the heart is deceitful above all things. Let me give you an example. Last night, my wife and I had some ice cream together. You know when you get a tub out of the freezer and it's like really hard to get the ice cream out? And you're just really working hard. It's hurting your wrist. You're bending spoons. The whole thing's a mess. And I prepared one bowl for my wife. And then I thought, this, this is too hard. I'm not preparing another bowl. So I gave my wife the bowl. And then I sat down with the tub. <laughs> and I tell you, when you sit down with the tub, you are playing a dangerous game. <laughs> In my head, I was like, I'll I'll eat a bowl's worth of ice cream, and then I'll put this back in the freezer. And I got to about that bowl's worth mark, and I was like, this salted fudge chocolate ice cream has got it going on right now. And I thought to myself, I want to eat this whole thing. And I turned to my wife and said, would you like any more ice cream? Because I sense something's happening in me, (laughs) and I think I'm going to eat this whole tub. And she was like, no, you're good. Now, in that moment... I had a desire to eat all that ice cream. A few moments later, when I saw the empty tub in my hands, there was a little bit of a difference between what I thought I wanted and what I actually wanted. I started thinking about the amount of fat in that tub of ice cream, the amount of sugar in that tub of ice cream. Effectively, that's all that's really in that tub of ice cream. (laughs) I said, that may not have been the best choice. And one of the things we have to come to terms with is, yeah, the heart wants what the heart wants, but the desires of the heart can be deceitful. And the things that we think we want, maybe we don't actually want them. When given an alternative framed by who Jesus is, it can shape the desires of the heart in some powerful ways. And here's what Paul is talking about when he says, set your heart on Christ who is above. He's saying, lean your desire towards who Jesus is. Then he gives us another key word as well. 
It's not just the heart set above, but it is the, anyone remember? The mind set above. And when I think of the mind, the, the, kind of, the kind of words that I'd add to that is kind of the will, the mind and the will. It's almost like when the mind is set above, it creates the infrastructure in our life so that we can follow the desires of our heart. And this has been the whole thing through the last series. First things first, that we need to create a life that leads us closer to Jesus, which is why we talked about seek first habits, prioritizing Sunday gatherings and worship as the first thing we do every week. Many of you over the last couple of weeks, you've been uh, following a prayer journal first thing in the morning. It's about cultivating these habits through the will setting our minds on, thing, on things above so we can cultivate and create a life that desires the things above. And I love these two pieces because you know what? Our will can actually focus the desires of our heart so that our heart becomes a little less deceitful. So it's not so much the heart wants what the heart wants, it's my heart wants Jesus. It's making a decision to say, my heart wants more of Jesus and I will cultivate a life that leads me closer to who He is. Let me take you back to the Scripture. Paul's got some more for us. Are you ready for a few more verses? This is a great passage of Scripture. Paul continues, he says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. So, so kind of keep that in your mind. There's the, the things set above, defined by who Christ is. And there's the things set below, which Paul would talk about as our earthly nature. And he uses this strong, dramatic language. Put those things to death, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And then he's got a list of things for us, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed. Now, here's the key word in all of this. It's idolatry. And I think the easiest way to talk about the heart and mind set below is a heart and mind set on self. Now, idolatry is, is really just as simple as placing anything above God. Now, of course, when our hearts and minds are set on self, we set ourselves above Christ. And that's the idolatry that Paul's getting at in this passage of Scripture. And he says, because of these, the wrath of God is coming, which means God is in opposition to putting anything above Him in our lives. He says, you used to walk in, this way, in these ways, in the life you once lived. So he acknowledges that there's been growth and transformation as they place their faith in who Jesus is. But then he says, there's still more. But now, you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self. Hold on to this key word. We're going to see it coming up a few times in the passage. Take off your old self with its practices and you've put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge, in the image of its creator. I love that phrase. Here there's no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is in all. Christ is all and is in all. So we get some new language here in this next section of verses. We, we start with the above and the below, and now we get the old self and the new self. Now, I want to illustrate this for us real quick here. John, could you help me with the whiteboard? And uh, there's, there's something in Paul's words here in this passage of Scripture that is so important just to rest in for a little while. And so I want to show you something here. I've come prepared. I stored my markers over here. It's all about preparation, right? Thank you, John. Now, I want to show you something here. As Paul's talking about the, the old self, he's talking about these list of qualities, almost these character, these behaviors that flow from the old self. Is this in the way for anyone? Let me move this for my friends on the left-hand side. How's everyone on the right-hand side? You guys Okay. And I apologize for mixing up the lefts and rights on your behalf. So here's, here's where we begin. I'm going to start down here. Paul talks about the old, the old, the old self. Is that legible to everyone? Can you read it for me? What does it say? The old self. So Paul starts with this idea of the old self, and he describes some of the behaviors that are connected to this old self. Now, here's the key, uh, I guess, the key distinctive of the old self, is that the old self isn't led by Jesus. The old self is led 
by self. And when you're led by self, that can lead your life into some things that actually oppose who God created you to be. And then we see some of the the list of behaviors that were like, yeah, I don't really want to live a life that looks like that. He's saying, that's the old self. That's who you were when sin had the final word over your life. But you know, we sang some songs this morning that remind us that sin doesn't have the final word anymore because he's the one that has power in his name that breaks every chain that by faith through grace, we get the opportunity to meet our... Oh, I'm going to make this too big. Did I spell creator right? And this is what Paul says, the old self is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of its creator. So the old self is renewed when it interacts with our creator who is God through Christ upon the the cross by grace through faith. And when the old self encounters the creator through Jesus, something changes in us and we become the, yeah, you guys are on it. We become the new self. And so Paul talks about that when our hearts and minds are set above, and we have this experience of the Creator that by His Holy Spirit allows our hearts and minds to be set above on who Jesus is, we actually become something new. Now, I want to give you the next passage of Scripture before I finish this off. Now, listen to how Paul describes the new self here. And we're in verse uh, verse 12 now. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all of these virtues, put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. So Paul's describing the fruit of the life lived out of the new self. Now, here's something that really, really helped me in my journey of faith when I think about this picture. Because if you just look at this framework of the the old self before I met Jesus, you can kind of say, yeah, that guy, he he wasn't great. (laughs) So think about who I am before I met Jesus. That guy right here, he had some problems. He, He wasn't that special. He wasn't in a good way. Then luckily, that guy met Jesus and was renewed in the image of the Creator, and now he's new. Now, what we can do if we just hold on to that model, we can kind of think, yeah, who I was wasn't good. And then Jesus changed my life, and now I'm a new self, and now I'm good. Does that cause tension for anyone? It does? It's not just me? Now, let me show you what's actually happening here. So remember, Paul says, the old self is renewed in the image of the Creator. Now, Genesis tells us that Humanity, male and female, is made in the image of who? In the image of God. So we are made in the image of the Creator. Then when we meet Jesus, we are renewed in the image of the Creator that we were always created to be. So the new self here is actually like the old, old self. It's the created self. And that's an equal sign. They're not normally upside down like that, so I thought I needed to explain. So what actually happens when we come to know Jesus, it's not like the old me that was terrible has become something brand new that's now good. It's like the old me, the old self, was created in the image of God and was wonderful. And then through Jesus, it was renewed to the fullness of who God always created me to be. So you were never bad. You were never awful. God created you in His image, that your life was always defined by beauty and love from the Father. But then when we meet Jesus, it wakes up our heart to that reality, and we are renewed to who we were always created to be. Known known and loved by God, with hearts and minds set above. Now, here's the other challenge that I have with this whole picture of salvation. 
Anyone ever have wrestles with faith? Can I tell you, wrestles with faith are really, really helpful. They're really, really important. Now, let me tell you, here's, here's another problem I have. If I've been made new, so remember Paul's talking about the, these list of traits like anger, malice, slander, all these kind of things. Like if I've been made new, why do I sometimes look like this guy still? Right? If I've been renewed in the image of my creator back to who I was always created to be, why do I have days where I look more like this guy than this guy? You know, I think Paul uses another really helpful framework in this passage of Scripture. He talks about the old and the new self, but he uses this really special word. He says, clothe yourself. Clothe with compassion, with forgiveness, with grace. So as we've been renewed in the image of our Creator, that identity is fixed and unchanged. The power of sin is gone. Sin no longer has the final word on my life. Jesus has the final word on my life. Amen? Jesus has the final word on your life. But you still got to decide what you're going to wear. You still got to decide what you're going to wear. John, can you bring up my, my rack? You're like, what's a rack? Am I going to put John on the rack? I'm not. I want to think about this another way for a moment. Can you go at that side? That would be lovely. Thanks, John. I just want people to see your biceps as you're flexing out <laughs> along the way. So let's think about this a different way. Anyone ever done a really dirty job before? <laughs> yeah? We, we've done some dirty jobs. Any, any parents, you've had some experiences with exploding nappies and things like that, I'm sure. I won't take you back. No, I can't help it. Exploding nappy in a, in a child seat. It's like... So many crevices, so many places for it to go. Oh, we, we've all experienced dirty jobs. So I remember re- recently we were, doing, we were doing some work around the campus here, changing these square ceiling panels that you see up in the roof. And under e- on top of each one of those, there's this rectangle of insulation that, that's made out of some kind of coarse fiberglass. And as you lift them up, it, it kind of breaks apart and falls on you. And it's this really itchy stuff that just gets everywhere. It gets down your shirt, gets in your hair, it's on your face. It's a nightmare. And, uh, and what made it even more fun, we discovered that at the time we had, uh, we kind of had a mouse problem. Um, <laughs> we had a mouse problem. So as you're lifting up, there's this fiberglass coming down, there's mouse poo coming down, and you're just not enjoying your experience of life. It's not quite as bad as New South Wales right now. Has anyone seen like those buckets of mice that are just, you know, WA more and more, it's just becoming like this, <laughs> this amazing place to live. We've got you know, mice plagues. Hopefully it's not coming yet. But anyway, we, we had some mice things going on. I remember I, I was wearing these clothes and they were filled with this fiberglass and hopefully not, not too much mouse poo. And, and when you do a really dirty job like that, the number one thing that you want to do is get those clothes off and, and just get in the shower and just clean off the fiberglass, anything else that's going on, whatever that was, whatever that dirty job for you was that day. You just want to get all that stuff off. And so, so you get home, you, you throw the clothes in your laundry bin. You've got a cool flappy thing like me. And, and you throw the clothes there, you get in the shower, you use every cleaning product you have, you borrow your wife's fancy shampoos and you just make sure everything is back to normal and good. Now, I wanted to layer this over our experience of faith and, and spiritual formation, this idea of growing to become more like Christ, that, that when we meet Jesus, it's kind of like that taking off the dirty clothes moment, that we're completely restored and renewed. Those things that used to define who we are, they don't have the final word over us anymore. Sin, the power of sin, that's gone. That is, that is thrown to the side. And the clothing that fit on the sinful person goes to the side, to the bin. And then we're completely clean, we're restored, we're renewed. And then we, then we come out and we think about, okay, what am I going to wear? And this is something we've got to think about every day. Do I wear the old clothes or do I wear the new clothes? And Paul talks about this clothing. He lists it for us. He talks about things like anger, gossip, slander, rage, sexual immorality, greed, all the things of self. They're the clothes of the old self. And, and let's face it, some days I reach for some of those clothes and I pull something dirty out of the wash and... 
and I try it on for size. And, and you put something older on. And I don't know if you've ever put something old on and you're like, something doesn't feel right here. Something doesn't feel right. Now, there's this wonderful experience we have as we follow Jesus that sometimes we'll reach for some of the clothing of the old self. We'll maybe start to gossip about someone. Maybe we'll be dishonest and, and lie about something. Maybe we'll be selfish in some way. And sin starts rearing its head in one way or another in our life. But now you've got this realization and reality that Christ has made me new in my inner being. And now these clothes, they don't feel like they fit anymore. And something in your soul, it's deeper than just a conscience, something in your soul leads you to the point that says, this doesn't fit me anymore. This isn't right on me anymore. Since I've met Jesus, this, this just doesn't feel right. And then by grace, through repentance, we can, we can take that right off. And hopefully not drop a microphone. <laughs> and we put the old back where it belongs. And then we reach for something that actually fits. Something that's new. Something that's fresh pressed, it's got a nice scent to it. And we put on the new clothing that's made for the the new person. This bit's going to be tricky. And something about this just feels right. Thank thank you. (laughs) That is secretly what I was fishing for. We put on something now that, yeah, this aligns with what Christ is doing in my life. That when I make a decision to be compassionate towards someone, when I make a decision to be patient with my children, when I make a decision to be gracious towards someone, when I make a decision to forgive someone, knowing that Christ has forgiven me, all of a sudden you start to put on those kind of clothes and you're like, mm, this fits with, with what Christ has done in my life. This fits with who Jesus is calling me to be. With my heart and mind set above on who Jesus is, not set on myself anymore, this just fits. I get a sense that, that this is who God always, always created me to be. Can I tell you, sin doesn't have the final word on your life anymore. Jesus does. And He says you're redeemed. He says you are loved dearly by the Father. And Scripture this morning reminds us that we don't have to live in the clothes of the old self anymore. But Jesus has got something new for us that actually fits for a man or woman made alive in Christ. And that's what he wants to invite us to grow towards. You know, I want to finish with this idea for, for this week. And, and the team, you can come and join us. And maybe, John, you can remove some of my outfits if you wouldn't mind. <sighs> Thank you. I want to give you a final verse. It's the final verse from this passage of Scripture. And it says this, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Peace of Christ. Since as members of one body, you are called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your heart. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. I love this phrase, in in all that you do, do it for Jesus. And that takes us back to the very first verse of this passage of Scripture. 
set your hearts on things above. Every part of who you are, do it for Jesus. And when that's the point of reference, you're actually saying, my heart and my mind, it's focused up here and not down here on who I am. In all that we do, set our hearts and mind on Christ, and you'll be amazed. The clothing you reach for is going to start being defined by who Jesus is and not who we once were. Now, we're not going to get it right every day. Paul himself writes in Romans chapter 7, some of you will remember it, what I want to do, I do not do. That which I hate, I keep on doing. Who will rescue me from this wretched body of sin? Anyone remember that what comes next? Praise be to God through Christ Jesus our Lord. That He saves us, He renews us, sin does not have the final word anymore. I want us to stand together. Would you stand with me? I want to give you three real quick things to take into your week. Because I always believe that engaging with Scripture is about hearing, digging, and also thinking, what, what shape does this bring to my life? Here's three questions for you to consider this week. Is there one thing that you need to take off? Something that you're wearing that just doesn't fit with who Jesus has created you to be? Is there one thing that needs to be taken off your life this week? Is there one thing that you need to put on? Something that you want to put on. If you can stretch it out to three, be my guess. But I reckon for most of us, there's probably going to be one big one, right? Anyone got that one big one in your heart already? Most of us do. Something to take on. And then a new habit that's going to help you to do that. This is that idea of the mind, the will being set above. Now I'm actually going to build something into my life. It's going to bring transformation and change. So there's three practical things to think about coming out of this message. You got those in mind? Good. Now I want to pray God's blessing over your life. I want to acknowledge that the Holy Spirit is here in this place. God with us. If you're new to that language of the Holy Spirit, it's just this reminder that God's holy presence has been given us to experience whenever we seek Him. I want to pray this passage of Scripture over your life. Would you let me pray for you this morning? Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are here in this place. Jesus, I thank you for this word prepared through Paul for us this morning. God, our prayer is to have hearts and minds set above on who you are. God, our prayer is to remember that we are renewed in your image. That God, you take us in fullness to who we were always created to be that we never need to look back at our life with shame or guilt or pain. But God, we look back at our life and say, Jesus, you've redeemed, you've renewed, you've restored. Who I was was always dearly loved by you. Now, God, help me to grow into who you've called me to be. Jesus, I pray that you would help each one of us to see ourselves as you see us, Lord God. Jesus, help us to take off the things that don't fit with who we are in you anymore. Help us to put on the things that align with who you've created us to be. And God, for every person here this morning that's got one thing to take off, one thing to put on, God, I pray that you would give them the courage and the focus to be intentional with that this week. Holy Spirit, We thank you for the grace of the Son, for the love of the Father, and for the presence of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, as we sing this final song together, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be here speaking. We praise you, God. Come on, church. Let's let's lean into the presence of God one more time together here this morning.